Hey Calvary, how you doing? We're just, Chris and I are just standing outside of Moss Conveyancing here um, and we got some really exciting news. We have just signed the paperwork to make the building, Calvary Chapel Albany, our own. So um, congratulations church, we have a home, we have a legacy and um, we're going to pass this one on to the next generation. Chris? Yes, every, every step of the way. Um, it's been what, 15 years? Maybe a bit longer now? Indeed. Where we've seen God's hand move every step of the way leading us to this point which is ready to lead us to the next one as Steve says, for the next generation. God is blessed and he will continue to bless. We are so thankful. Woohoo! God bless you. Alright. Yeah. Let's go. They're talking about revival and the need for love. That little church has come alive. Working with each other for the common good. Putting all the past aside. Long hair, short hair, some clocks and ties. People find it coming around. Looking past the hair and straight into the eyes. It's not the way it used to be. thing well Steve makes that work I, I have one job in this place and that was to push a button and he broke it and it didn't happen Steve Steve I'll only steal a couple of minutes Ryan because this morning of course is all about children's church and you know and I and I've been thinking over the last uh, just the last week or so that that one statement that I made up there and I'm sorry I hadn't shaved I just got off the plane the night before when Steve said, let's make a little video. Um, so, and he still hasn't shaved. Did you notice that? 
And, um, but it is every step of the way, and it's amazing. It's about, it's less than 12 months now since we had that, remember we had that, imp that, that, we had that leaders meeting, and we had this impromptu question, you might remember I mentioned this before, where I, where I think the question was raised, hey, what would happen if the owner of this building um, wanted to sell it? And, um, and then we had this, you know, this deep spiritual conversation, these wise, wise spiritual leaders of your congregation, they sat back and said, well, the Lord would, and off we went, and we had at least, well, I was driving home from that meeting, and I got a phone call from the owner of the building, who said, Chris, I need to talk to you. Saw him the next day, said, hey, I need to get rid of the building. Right. And... Um, and then I met, we met again a few days later, and all those wise, deep, spiritual statements are all out the window, you know? What are we going to do? <laughs> it was a bit like that. But anyway, but, our, our, but you know, the immediate, the immediate thought was, well, we believe the Lord was saying, well, we just need to know what the people want to do. And so that's, that next Sunday, we stood before you and said, well, we really want to know what your heart is as to what we should be doing, or where we should be. Be led. I know what our heart was. Our heart was obviously that we've always felt that this was our home. And it's because every step of the way, God has always orchestrated our steps. And that's an amazing thing. And, um, and, it, and, and, and I find this, you know, that's, so it's happened, right? Um, the, the provision has, uh, is there. And, um, and it's amazing the way that it, is, it, has, it has come. And I'm talking about the finances to be able to purchase this place. And it's amazing the way that it's happened. It didn't happen the way I envisioned it would happen. Um, but God has provided. And um, every step of the way, he's been showing us. And you would think, because we've called this, this the, the program, we call it Legacy, right? Because it's about the next generation. We need to secure a home. Um, did, did you see that very first um, photo? It was eight people in a lounge room. That was that was that was our, my lounge room, and that was our very first service, you know, and um, those years ago. But every step of the way, the Lord has provided, and we've called this legacy. It's for these guys that God is raising up, and that's why they are they are taking this morning service. Now you would think that we would plan it that way, wouldn't you? That we would have a service today that is about the young people, or the young people leading the service because they are the legacy, right? You would think we would plan it that way, but we didn't plan it that way. It just happened that way, you know. Um, so God has blessed us, and, um, and we do look forward to his continued blessing upon us, and... And Ryan's going to get up and he's going to share in a minute. I've probably stolen half of his, have I? Sorry, good. He's going to get up and share. And um, so God bless you. Yeah. I was, um, what, was, what was meant to happen is Steve has strategically placed a confetti, confetti cannon up there. And that, that was meant to go off and shower confetti over all of you. <laughs>see everyone thanks well welcome to church this morning hey it's a little bit different kids you paying attention you ready to go 
Yeah, good. You can stay there, all right? I don't mind a bit of noise and mess. It's going to be cool, all right? Well, uh, thanks, Steve and Chris. That's awesome. Um, it's great to have a place to be able to call our home, yeah? It is. And uh, I will talk a little bit more about how we fit into that as kids. Uh, my name's Ryan, and together with my lovely wife, Helen, who's not here, she's in Tasmania at the moment. <laughs> Don't blow that cannon off unexpectedly, all right? <laughs> together with my lovely wife, Helen, we uh, look after the kids' ministry here at Calvary, which we've had the great pleasure of taking on in the last sort of month or so. Um, so she's in Tasmania. Hopefully she will watch this sometime. She, she does most of the work. I just tag along for the ride and I build cool things like time machines. So if you see some of that cool stuff, please feel free to poke your head into the kids area after the service. There's always something going on with our themes and our messages. We use a curriculum that helps us with that a little bit. Uh, but before I start this morning, I just wanted to uh, have a little bit of a chat for the parents anyway uh, about who we are and what we are. And I love that all this stuff does seem to work out. God has a great sense of humour and timing and he loves to work things out according to what's going on. And uh, part of what we feel about kids is it's not just about the, the, the kids are not just the next generation. They're the next generation in terms of age. But in terms of who they are in God and who they are spiritually is that they are the now generation. As much as we are and as much as our grandparents are, they are the now generation. And so we believe not that we're going to stick them in a back room and hide them away and forget about them or that we sort of, you know, kids out of the service, we were, you know, mum and dad time and all that kind of jazz. But we believe very strongly involving kids in who we are as a church and who we are here and now in this place, yeah? So we'll do things like this all the time, yeah? It'll be messy occasionally. Yeah, we'll be messy occasionally. Because, uh, yeah, we believe in that. Um, I just want to read, uh, to start that off, I just want to read the first passage of Scripture. It's not up here on the screens. But it's from Mark 10, 13 to 16. And it talks about Jesus bringing the children to him. And it said, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. I love that word, indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child, will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. This is one of my little, when it comes to kids, one of my guiding philosophies. Jesus, the ultimate rabbi that he was, the esteemed leader of his time, he didn't say, no, nah, no, nah, I'm too busy for you children. Sorry, I've got all these adults to teach. I've got all these adults to sort out over here. He's like, no, you silly disciples. He was indignant at them. He was really upset at them. He's like, bring the children. The children are the most important thing that we have in this place right now. And that was essentially what he was saying. And so that's part of our philosophy as, kid, as kids ministers. We believe children are the most important thing in the world. So trust us that when we have your children out there, we are doing our utmost to train and equip them and bring them up in everything that God has for them, yeah? Because God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, that you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me with all your heart. This is for you kids, yeah? You listening? God has a unique plan and purpose for your lives. He doesn't want you to think that you have to grow up in order to do what God wants you to do. You can do that right now. And we don't know the caliber of kids that are sitting in front of us right now. We don't know that they're going to go on to be future prime ministers, future leaders in industry, future leaders in ministry. They can be doctors. They can be engineers. They can be great mums and dads. They can be anything they put their hearts to. And God has called all of you kids for a unique plan and purpose. So don't ever forget that, all right? Cool? Got that? Great. All right, let's go with the message. <laughs> I've preached on that for ages, but I won't. So you like my shirt? Anyone like my shirt? Anyone want my shirt? Yeah? You want my shirt? I'll give it to you, yeah? Yeah? 
You guys, who else wants my shirt? Any adults like my shirt? You want a piece of my shirt? You want my shirt. All right, hang on, here we go. I'll give you it afterwards, all right? <laughs> Who wants my shirt now? <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> Don't ruin the story. <laughs> but it's not the same, is it, when we tear it apart, yeah? Well, it isn't. It's not a whole shirt. What are you going to do with this? It's just a piece of it, isn't it? <clears throat> Looks like I've been attacked by a lion or a crocodile or something. Yeah, I'll give you some after, okay? But that's what our story is about today. So what we're doing today is we're following on with where the kids have been up to in our kids' church out in the, th in the rooms. We've been going through the first books of the Bible and we're up to a, a passage of scripture from 1 Kings. So 1 Kings 11, 27 through 40. And some of what we've been doing is we, don't, we do all these cool things. We have lots of slides and cool videos. But the one thing that you walk through today, what did we walk through today? Time machine. And what do we do with the time machine? We imagine. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to look to a, a clip. We're going to listen, kids, and we're going to close our eyes. And remember, we're going to use our imagination, yeah? We're going to pretend we're going through the time machine, yeah? And then we'll continue on from there. Thanks. Not that one. Not that one. Which one? Which one? The ITM one. <laughs> the one with the little animated dude. Sorry about the really great planned out videos <laughs> today. <laughs> Lucky we just got everyone in. That's all just crazy. Hello, everybody. My name is Max. I'll be your guide in the ITM. That stands for Imagination Time Machine. There are some rules you need to follow for a safe trip in the ITM. First, close your eyes when I tell you to, and don't open them until I tell you to. The ITM projects in the darkness. If you open your eyes, its projection system shuts down. Second, follow my imagination instructions closely so you don't get lost. I'm setting the imagination destination right now. Location, outside the walls of Jerusalem. Time, 930 BC. All righty then. This would be a good time to close your eyes and imagine you're rocketing through time and space. Brace yourself. We're coming in for a landing. Imagine the doors of the ITM open as you step out. Imagine you're standing outside of the walls of Jerusalem, the capital city of the Promised Land. It's a sunny day, but clouds are building on the horizon. What does this ancient city look like to you? What sort of sounds do you hear coming from Jerusalem? Can you feel the warm summer breeze blowing on your skin? Now imagine a man named Jeroboam walks out of the city gate. Jeroboam is one of King Solomon's officials. But he's not happy with the king. He's headed somewhere in a hurry. But then a man stops him. Quick, they're standing near a tree. Sneak behind it and listen to what they're saying. 
Jeroboam. My name is Ahijah. I am a prophet from God. He has a message for you. Imagine that the prophet takes off his coat and begins tearing it into 12 pieces. Can you see it? Imagine the sound of the tearing fabric. Now imagine that Ahijah the prophet hands Jeroboam 10 of the 12 pieces. King Solomon was wise in his youth, but now he worships false gods and he encourages others to do the same. God has called him to turn away from his sin, but he refuses. So here is what God will do. These 12 pieces of fabric are like the 12 tribes of Israel. God is going to tear the 10 northern tribes away from Solomon's family and give them to you. When King Solomon hears about the prophecy, he flies into a rage. Imagine Jeroboam fleeing for his life toward the country of Egypt. He knows that if King Solomon ever catches him, he'll be dead meat. A short time later though, King Solomon dies of old age. His son, Rehoboam, becomes the new king over the 12 tribes of Israel. Thinking that it's safe now, Jeroboam returns from Egypt to rejoin his family. Imagine the new king standing among the people of the 10 northern tribes as Jeroboam and the other tribal leaders approach him. Imagine Jeroboam kneeling before King Rehoboam out of respect. Shh, listen carefully. Jeroboam is saying something. Your father, King Solomon, made us work hard. Too hard. If you treat us more kindly, the ten northern tribes will serve you. You think my father worked you hard? I'll work you even harder. You think my father beat you with whips? I'll beat you with bigger whips. But the king's threats don't have their intended effect. The people of the ten northern tribes can't believe their ears. Imagine as their faces turn angry. Imagine the sound as the crowd begins to murmur and shout their displeasure at the new king. Suddenly, the anger boils over and people begin throwing stones at one of the king's henchmen. Imagine the sight and sound of rocks whizzing by. Imagine being in the crowd as it now rushes toward the king. King Rehoboam realizes that his cruelty has pushed the people too far and that his life is in danger. Picture the king running for his life as the angry crowd chases him. Can you hear the chaos? Imagine the king jumping into his chariot and racing away just before the crowd can get their hands on him and tear him apart. As the dust settles and calm returns, the ten northern tribes choose Jeroboam as their new king. They call themselves Israel. Meanwhile, the two southern tribes remain loyal to King Rehoboam. They call themselves Judah. Ahijah's prophecy has come true. Just like the coat, God has torn a once great nation into pieces. And all because of Solomon's sin. Well, I think that does it. We best be getting back to the ITM. Imagine yourself stepping into the ITM one last time. Be sure to strap yourselves in. Destination, present day. We'll be arriving home in three, two, one. You can open your eyes now. Arriving home in three, two, one. Look oh, back. Do you feel younger? <laughs> open your eyes now. Okay. Can open your eyes. Do you feel younger? 
You sort of not really. <laughs> feel older. Well, you are only five, so <laughs> you got a long way to go. It's cool, hey. It always astounds me that uh, in that story we think about if you realise that when we're talking about Jeroboam, we're only talking like three generations of kings down the line, yeah? How quickly did the nation of Israel under a king fall apart? Thanks, Steve. It always astounds me about that. So I just want to go back a little bit and uh, have a quick focus on Solomon because this is kind of where it all started, yeah? For this story, with it all falling apart. So we'll just go back to 1 Kings 11, 4 to 11. And it says this. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, I practiced all these, Molech, the detestable gods of the god of the Amorites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as his David, his father, had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Amorites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to the Lord. The Lord became very angry with Solomon because his heart turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. So that's what our tearing of the cloak was about, kids, yeah? Do we understand that? You've still got the shirt, thanks. So what happened in that time was, instead of it all staying as one piece, the shirt was torn in, into 11 pieces, or 12 pieces, and all the pieces of the kingdom were given out. So what's the problem here with Solomon? There's an interesting word in there that uh, talks about this word covenant. You have not kept my covenant and my decrees. And what are, what are we talking about when we talk about covenant kids? Do we know? What are we, what's covenant about? Yeah? It's a promise, yeah. Between who? Yeah. And what is it reliant on a little bit? What's it reliant on a little bit? What has God asked of the people? What did he ask? I don't know. To follow him. And where do we find some of that? So let's go to Exodus 20. Surely you guys know some of these. Do you know the Ten Commandments? Where'd they come up? Do we know the Ten Commandments? Anyone know them off by heart? Don't grow a head up. All right. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What's the first one? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall, have, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or above or in the earth below or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but show love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Next one. What's the next one? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the, God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Next one. What's the next one? Can you remember the middle one? What's, what's the other one he says? No, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do no, you shall not do any work, neither you, your son, your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. This one, this is the most important one. Honour your father and your mother, 
Yes, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. I tell my kids that all the time. They probably get sick of it, hearing it. <laughs> See, that's how well they listen to me, hey? Next one. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You should not covet your neighbour's house. That means you should not want to have your neighbour's ha neighbor's house. You're not, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, nor his male or female servant, nor his ox or his donkey, his car or his boat or his jet ski, or anything else that belongs to your neighbour. So in the commandments, what are the first four, or first five, -ish, first four, what do they relate to? Amity, please. What do they relate to? What are the first four commandments about? Us and God. So they're vertical commandments, yeah? So they're more talking about our relationship with God, yes? What does he say? You shall have no gods beside me. You'll not worship any other images. What did Solomon do? He did. His heart got turned away. And so instead of him remaining pure to God, what did he do? No, 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 sort of. What did he do? What did he follow instead of God? Idols, that's it. He replaced God with other idols. And so what was the consequence of that? Yes. What's the consequences of him following other idols? Can't do. What happened? What was the shirt tearing about? Yes. What happened? The kingdom was teared apart. <laughs> oh, cool. So we can see, kids, we can see from this that there are consequences to our sin, isn't it? Yeah? That's primarily what we're getting at. What were the consequences to Solomon for his sin? The kingdom was torn out of his hand. It was only two generations down, or three generations down, that suddenly the kingdom of Israel is torn apart. What's one of the major differences between him, between Solomon and David, his father before him? What did David? What was David? What did David do when he was caught in sin? Adults, you can answer as well. I like interactiveness. <laughs> What did David do? What was one prime difference that David did that Solomon didn't really do when he was caught in sin? Repentance, yes. yes. What did David do when he was caught out having a friendly relation with someone that wasn't really his wife? What happened? When he was caught out, what did he do? He tore his cloak, he fell his feet in front of God and he had to suffer the consequence still, yeah? But he was repentant. What did Solomon do when he was caught out in his sin? got angry. That's it. He got angry and upset and he actually tried to kill Jeroboam. Yeah? Yes. So, idols. Do we have any idols in our lives? Me. Yes, that's a good one. Me. It's usually about ourselves, isn't it? Money. Yes. What else can we have? Hey, people, yes, we can place people, cows, donkeys. <laughs> what are we talking about when we talk about idols? What is it usually? Anything that comes between us and God, yeah? It's something that we place on a higher pe pedestal above God. Money, yes. All right, Shh. I'll ask the questions. Don't just call out. What happens with them? What do we normally do? What did Solomon do? Instead of worshipping God, he raised up. I'll ask. I'll actually. Yeah, okay, great. All right, shh, just for a little moment. I'll ask you questions when I need questions, okay? Sometimes I talk in rhetorical questions, which don't really need an answer. So, what God did. Uh, sorry, I'll get back. The kids are. So, what Solomon did is he. He turned away from God, but what else did he do? He built the high places. And that's what we do with idols, is we exalt things into a high place. We put them on a pedestal above where God should be. And that's what becomes an idol in our lives, giving honour where it's not due. Because we can do that in a myriad of ways. That doesn't have to be bad stuff, yeah? 
Because that's the thing, sometimes we, get, we go, oh, idols are all the bad stuff in our life, and if we follow them, then we're making idols. But sometimes it can be the good things in our lives. It can be our family. It can become an idol if we place it on a high place above God. It can be our work. It can be our church. It can be our pastor. It can be all these things. It can be, become idols in our lives if we exalt them to a place that is higher than God, yeah? So Solomon's sin led down the line, yeah? Led to the kingdom being split apart. Then what did it lead his son Rehoboam to do? What did Rehoboam do? This is a question I want answered. What did he do? Drive them harder. So no longer is he just sinning against God. Who else is he sinning against? The rest of the people, that's right. And so this is kind of what the kids' message was mostly about today, was that sin tears friendships apart. It doesn't just tear kingdoms apart. It doesn't just destroy communities, but it can destroy the friendships around us, yeah? So, all right, kids, we are going to finally play with the Jenga. Yes. 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 Right, but what I want... No, no, so it's a little bit interactive, all right? Can you guys handle this for a moment? We're going to play a game. So hopefully, kids, if you want to play, I need an adult with you as well, okay? So I need an adult and a kid, all right? In a pair, not me, because I'm up here, sorry. And then you guys need to stand back a little bit, okay? All right, so who can we do? Who wants to do it? Quick. All right, we, do you have a kid? <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> You'll pick up. All right, come on, quick, two volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> you need your parents to participate with you. Can we do that? Quick, come on. Grab your dad or your mum. Come on. Not me, not me. All right. All right. We only need two volunteers, two lots of couples. Great. All right. You other kids hop out of the way. So what we're going to do... Too many volunteers. Oh, it doesn't matter. We can do three. But what I want you to do is I want the kids to stand behind their parents. Yeah. Kids to stand behind their parents. You're going to reach your arms through. Mum's going to, mum or dad's not going to use their arms. All right, this is going to be tricky. Are we going to get this organised? Stand behind your mum. Put your hands through mum. Right? Like under there. Yeah, and mum is, you're going to try and do, yeah, there we go. Right, good, phew, finally got there. All right, you ready? And it's speed Jenga, right? So you've got two and a half minutes to see who can get the most. You ready? Set, go. Come on, it's speed Jenga. It's not like wait around Jenga. Come on, that's it, quick. Yeah, that's it. Oh, 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 yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Come on, quick. You've only got two minutes. Oh, 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 there's a bit of cheating. Come on. Quick. Oh, oh good job. Oh, oh. Come on. Oh, it's just not get tall enough. That's all right. You might need mum's help a little bit. Come on. Oh, is he going to fall? Give me a minute, quick. Quick, come on, quickly. Oh, yeah. Almost, almost. I'm okay if it falls over. I don't know if we're going to last the two and a half minutes. It might fall over before that. Quick. Oh, okay. Maybe you might need to... Maybe you can take your arms out if it's gotten too short now. Mum might have to help. Oh. Well, you guys are doing really well. Come on, quick. Come on, come on. Faster, 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 faster. Oh, 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 oh. I don't know if you're allowed to catch Jenga. Wait, I don't think you're allowed to catch it. All right, great. 
You're right, buddy. Get freaked out. Hey, I'm Nick. Uh, sorry, I don't know your name. I'm going to. I had enough. Seen I ripped up a shirt, and I feel, felt really bad that I didn't give one away. Do you want a shirt? There you go. It's too big for you. It's too small for you. Sorry, dude. There you go. See, this is all the fun you can have in kids' church. <laughs> All right, sit down, kids. Sit down. Leave the blocks. Uh, both one. Both one. Cool. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Well done, guys. Well done. So this is all the fun you can have in kids' church. So sign up now. Come see me after the service. <laughs> Always looking for volunteers. No, while I'm on that, I do appreciate all of you guys that serve regularly and faithfully in kids' church. I really do. I really appreciate it. Without it, if I was in, having to be in there all the time, that would drive me nuts. You guys are awesome. Not nuts, sorry. I would burn myself out. So we love you guys and we appreciate all the hard work that you guys do give into our kids as well. So it's great. Thanks. So what happened with the tower, guys? All right, you can hand those out now. I have some little colouring ins as well to try and keep the kids going for the last sort of 10 minutes or so. But what happened with our tower? What was it before we started? It was nice. It was built. It was solid, wasn't it? It was all square. And what happened as we started to pull pieces out? It started to break into pieces. That's it. And that's what sin can do to our community, whether it's in our community of faith or whether it's our society as a whole. As we take pieces out, can we leave the Jenga pieces alone, please? Oh, well. It's messy. That as sin comes in and we take pieces out or we take people out of our solid tower through offence or unrepentance or whatever, what happens is the tower becomes weaker and weaker and it falls apart, yeah? Kids, you get that? Right. No. <laughs> so James 4, 1 to 3 says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires... <coughs> that battle within you. You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you might spend on your pleasures. Ooh. So looking back at the commandments, those last few are not vertical, command, not vertical sins anymore, are they? They're horizontal. They're sins between people. Murder, adultery, covetousness, all those kind of sins are sins between people, yeah? They're sins, horizontal sins. And so it's those things that can start to tear us apart. And so what does Jesus have to say about this? Coming from Matthew 5, 21, 45. Kids, while you do that, can we not talk too much? Cool. Pay attention still as well, all right? So, you have heard that it is said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. 27. You have heard that it is said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery within her in her heart. You have heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you might be children of your Father in heaven. The fun bit about Jesus is he doesn't just say, he's having a bit of a go at the uh, religious leaders of his time because they thought they were all there, yeah, didn't they? They thought they could achieve some level of what God had asked them. They were like, yeah, yeah, I'm good at all this. I don't murder, I, I don't do any of that stuff. But what did Jesus say? He took it to the next level. He goes, I don't just want you to have this outward appearance of it. I'm also very interested in what's going on in your heart. Yeah? He wasn't just after an outward observance. He was also about an inward attitude. Jesus raised the bar of it. And so this is the, the fun bit for us, is that we're not just here to try and observe something, but Jesus is also after our heart. 
Matthew 5, 17 to 18 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. So he didn't do away with it. Yeah, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The great bit about Jesus is he didn't leave us hanging, did he? Yeah? He didn't leave us hanging. He didn't just go, hey, I, I want you to aspire to this greater level. But then he also said, I know you can't get there. I know that you can't get there on your own. And so what did he do? He came to fulfill it. Remember that Jesus, uh, as I said earlier, he's the ultimate rabbi. He wasn't just some guy that came out of nowhere. He knew all of the scriptures, yeah? Because if he was growing up in that Jewish tradition of the time, he would have learnt the scriptures word for word, basically. And he would have known everything that was contained within them. For him to be able to say, I didn't just come uh, just for the fun of it, to abolish all this stuff, but I came to fulfill it. And so every single part of what was contained in there, Jesus knew that he could do. I love this scripture too. It's one of my favourites. Hebrews 9, 11 to 15. But when Jesus came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that was not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood, oh, by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood and the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this is the reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant for those that who have called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. This is the awesome pr uh, promise of Christ. So this is a new promise coming through Christ. Is that he doesn't just go, yeah, we'll get rid of it all. Don't worry about it. He, I love the fact that he took the way they were, that God has already been working in the world through the sacrifices. And he goes, I'm going to actually take that one step further. Yeah. You can sprinkle yourself with the blood of the lambs offered in sacrifice and you'll be clean on the outside. But what are you going to have to do next week? What do you have to do next week? You have to do it again. What do you do next year? You have to send the same goat out again next year. Again and again. The great bit about Christ is, is when, he does, when he came, he sprinkled us with his blood, but he didn't just do it so that we have to do it every weekend. It was a once and for all. And it wasn't just an outward appearance, it was the inward appearance. So not only did he go, I'm raising the bar for you, it's not just about the acts that you do, but it's the thoughts that you think. But don't worry, I've got you covered. Because if you believe in me, if you turn to me, I'm not just going to worry about your outward appearance and the outward acts. I'm actually really worried about what's going on inside. And so my blood will clear those conscience, conscience and you will be able to enter in with me. Yeah? He provided the way. He is the mediator of this new covenant. So what is our response in that? First John 1, 8 to 9. If we claim to be without sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he was faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The great scripture, yeah? So Christ didn't just raise the bar. He didn't just say, here I'm providing you a way. He then invites us to be a part of it, yeah? Invites us to come into that place and go, you know what? If we confess our sins, if we confess these things that tear us apart, if we turn from them, if we come to him, he is going to remove them as far as the east is from the west, yeah? So these things don't need to be at play in our world anymore. And this one, 1 John 2-9. to Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. So the trick is, kids, Yeah? If we upset each other, can you stop for a second and listen to me, yeah? One more second. If we do things 
that upsets each other, or if we do things we're not really that aren't great for each other, what should we do? What should we do? Do we leave them unsaid? Do we let them to fester? Do we let them to get worse and worse? Do we get angry with each other? No. The best thing to do, if you've done something that wasn't very nice to another person in your world, in your family or at school, the best thing you can do is go up and say, I'm really sorry I messed up. Yeah? Because then what does it do? And ask Jesus to forgive you. Ask him to come and to take that as far away from you as you possibly can, as he can, which is as far as the east is from the west. We sang, um, my kids, Steve asked my kids, my kids, uh, sorry, Steve asked my kids earlier in the week, what songs do you want? And so they picked a few. And then they picked that really lovely one. You will know that you're a Christian by our love, yeah? John 13, 35 says this, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The interesting thing about that last passage from Matthew is it's, it's very easy for us to love our friends, isn't it, yeah? It's very easy to love those people that love us. But it's even harder to love those that are against us or if we have problems with or if that are our enemies. But that's actually what we're meant to do as Christians, yeah? Cool. Steve, you want to come back up? I won't keep it too long because kids. But we're going to take communion now. And the great thing about communion is it gives us two ways to connect with God. If you, if you want to do communion with your kids, you're welcome to. Kids... How about, can everyone just go back to their parents for a little bit, please? Is that okay? I know my parents. You stay down there. Thanks. We'll give them a quick second. Kids, if you go sit with your parents for a second, please. The great thing about communion is it gives us the opportunity to stop and reflect on what God's done for us. And not just that it is a representation of what Christ has done, so reconciling us with God, but it also gives us an opportunity to stop and reflect on the things that might be tearing us apart as families, as groups, as friends. And it gives us the opportunity to go, is there anything that maybe I need to fix up in my world? Is there anything that maybe is left unsaid? That maybe, I don't know, I have to apologise to my kids nearly daily. Because I'm a dad, but I make mistakes. And we all make mistakes. And that's the thing that is highlighted to us is that we are all sinful we will all make mistakes but the great thing about it is is that God hasn't left us hanging Jesus hasn't left us hanging and so as we take communion today I encourage you to try and take it with your family take it with the people sitting next to you if you feel comfortable enough and maybe just stop for a moment and actually go God is there anything that I need to say today is there anything that maybe I've left unsaid to someone else or to my family or to my kids or kids to the parents? And is there an opportunity to be able to make that right now? Because as we've found that if we let sin to keep festering in our life, it can tear us apart and it has eternal consequences. But the thing is, is that we don't have to let it be that way because Christ has provided it all through, the, through his son. a bit ahead of the people handling it out.
almost there. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the communion elements to get to everyone. It says the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he had given 